Good afternoon, everyone. So we are going today, or this afternoon, to talk about natural language processing <clears throat> from the early days to LLMs, which, which are large language models that are the mainstream right now in NLP. So for a bit of background about myself, I'm Ismail Kone from Ivory Coast, Côte d'Ivoire, and I'm an assistant professor uh, of artificial intelligence at the Vital University. And uh, recently I've just started a postdoctoral uh, fellowship at the MRC, and I'm under the supervision of Dr. Bubaka, which is with us now. <clears throat> and uh, for, for today, we are going to first start by giving, giving a definition of NLP then look at some applications and uh, look at some milestones during the evolution of uh, NLP. Then talk about some ingredients that are, are for me, the key to the, modern, to the success of modern NLP. Then we are going to work, to work through a practical example where we are going to do some coding. And then talk about some opportunities for African in the field of NLP. Okay, first uh, I start by a definition. So, about uh, NLP. So, this is just one definition among many definitions, which is a subfield of AI that's aimed to get computers to understand natural language, like making a computer be able to understand language as human we are talking. So, this is the main objective of this NLP. And this is not a very easy task. In fact, it's very difficult. And people have been working on it since uh, the, the 50s. So, and uh, also, when I, uh, I'm talking about the human language in both forms, like speech and text, and text, yeah. So text, today we have some better results but the speech is a little bit lagging, it's more complicated. So now we are going to go through some applications to see what we can do with this technology. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good question. Sign language. Yeah. It's also considered as uh, NLP as well, because it's perhaps I would say the, so I say to get computer understand our language, because sign is also a language as well. Even if we are not speaking, but it's a kind of language. Even some people are working on, on that, in fact. Currently, I've seen a recent in the conference in Rwanda, where there are some African, in fact, that are working uh, on this because, you know, for example, when they go to hospital, some people, uh, they realize that some people die, for example, just because people can, then, cannot understand what they are saying. You know, they make some sign, but the other, for example, the doctor don't understand, he think it's another thing, and finally some people died about it. So they are, were doing some work to make the language uh, understandable as well. So that's a great question. So. Uh, language sign also is included in NLP. So one first example is topic modeling, which is the idea to get the main subject of a big corpus of text. And uh, as I mentioned, so as humans, sometimes we want to get information very rapidly. And we don't have time to read pages and pages of information. We just want to know what is the main, the main, the main point of the text. So in that case, the topic modeling can be a very good tool to help us understand the text before uh, taking some time or further time to explore the text. And also, for example, we have some spell checker that we all have in our cell phones. Sometimes you are tapping, as I was uh, saying, you are typing some text and you make a typo and you see directly a suggestion about the best word or the correct uh, spelling of a word. So behind the scene, it is a machine learning behind the scene that is running on your mobile phone to give you the best uh, uh, spelling of the word you want to type, for example. So we have this 
application as well. Also, we have the application of uh, sentiment analysis, as I mentioned. An example can be, for example, uh, uh, a company that has a brand and they want to know what people or what consumers think about their brand. So they can try to get some data from social media because this is where people express themselves freely. So have a kind of, I would say, unbi unbiased, even if it won't be uh, exactly biased, but we can say that in social media, people talk freely. So there you can have some better view of what people are saying. But getting all this data and reading each one of them to understand what consumers are thinking can be time consuming. So here we can use sentiment analysis, as I mentioned, combined with topic modeling, because when you scrape data, for example, from social media, you have many topics. So you must filter first to find which uh, post concern your brand. So then you can use topic modeling, for example, to identify the, uh, the set of posts that concern your brand. Then given this uh, shortlist post, you can apply sentiment analysis to understand what is the polarity of people's views. Is it positive, is it negative, is it neutral? And then based on that, you can make some decision about your marketing strategy and so on. So people are really using it right now for improving uh, so the image of their brand. Also, we have uh, the famous Google Translate uh, for machine translation. So after we are going to see how uh, you know, the Google Translate evolves through time when they add a neural network, how it improves. So we are going to see this example later. Also, we have question, question answering, for which we have the famous example of ChatGPT, which is making the buzz uh, everywhere now in the world. So this is also another task for NLP, among uh, other some other tasks. So I'm going to go through some other applications that I found very interesting. So this is, uh, as you can see on the image, a work from NVIDIA. So you see the same person multiple times. And there is a language on top. And there is what the person is saying. So this program, in fact, allow to have a real-time multilingual online meeting. This is a very complicated problem there. So I'm trying to solve here. Let us, you know, cut it in small piece, in small pieces, so that you may you may understand. First of all, someone is talking. So me, I'm from Ivory Coast. We we speak French basically. So I start speaking in French. And you are in the Gambia, you are listening to, listening to me. There are some people, uh, I would say, in Germany, they are listening to me. So what they build, in fact, here, they build what you, an avatar. So it's not my face that will be seen. It will be an, an avatar first. And this avatar, what it will mimic what I'm saying in the language of each uh, end uh, each person in the audience. So for people in, for example, Spain, in, in Spain, so when we see the, uh, oh, I call it, uh, the, picture? No, the picture, no, but the, the avatar. Yeah. Okay. You see the avatar speaking, saying what I'm saying. I'm, I'm, for example, for example I'm, I'm talking in French, but they will understand in English, in Spanish directly. And the avatar will mimic with the lips what I'm saying. The same thing will happen to people in German. When you hear in German, and the lips will mimic the sound in German. So you can see in real time, this is for English, how the lips is. For German, it's more closed. Uh, Spanish in between. For French, it's open. You see the mouth is open. And Mandarin. So this is a very complex. So we have 
machine translation in real time in multiple language, but also we have a component of computer vision behind the scene that connects the world to the motion of the face again. So these are very complex problems that today we can jump and try to solve them because of this recent advance in deep learning. People before were not thinking about this kind of problem because we were very far from that. We were trying to solve more simple problems. But now with that, you can imagine. So sometimes I, uh, I say to my student, never because sky is your limit today. Because people start to think all sorts of crazy things and they try and sometimes they get some small results. Sky is your limit. Because we found that this deep neural network, I kind of won't say finite, but we have very we have big room for exploring what is possible with this neural network. So you can come up with your own idea and try and see what you can do with that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there may be some demo where it works, but I'm sure that if you go deeper, you have some some kind of case where it doesn't work. But they are still trying to improve it. So it's a, it's a current product of NVIDIA. <clears throat> OK, another application that I found very interesting. So let's just look at what's happening in our continent. But we'll just look at uh, what is happening in the West. So this is a, an application that has been by Nigeria. So, and uh, the idea is, you know, babies. Babies do not speak. Most of the time, when they, they are not happy, they just cry. Uh, I was talking about this application of uh, NLP for detecting birth asphyxia. So it's a work that has been done by a Nigerian, so someone in our country, in our continent. Uh, the idea is to detect whether a baby is suffering from asphy asphyxia. So because baby, they are crying, but we don't know exactly what's happening when they are crying. They, for us, it's the same sound every time. But there are some difference between what is happening to a baby. So he designed this application that used NLP behind the scene to analyze the sound of the crying of a baby. And based on the sound, he can predict if he's suffering from asphyxia or not. So, and I say that this, uh, I mentioned that this application, this work has been very, has been recognized and get a grant to go to Max University in Canada, where is uh, improving the, the, this work. And uh, I've just started talking about the, in the biology, the application of NLP there. Because the, the same way we give a corpus of text to the algorithm, and you try to understand what's inside, people have tried, some researchers, in fact, have tried to apply the same thing in uh, biology to see if the algorithm can make sense of the different structures, like the molecule structures, in, uh, for example, a, a RNA or a DNA to understand what is inside it. And they, they found some very interesting results. So they were able, in fact, to generate some molecules and then classify them as well. Uh, I remember I've seen an article. So they, 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 just, they newly introduced the neural machine translation. That means they are now using a neural network for making translation. So in this article, I will highlight the, more, the, the most important part. So here they mentioned that they were using a phrase-based translation system for making the translation of a, of a test. And uh, if some people were using Google Translate in 2014, 2016, 15, well, you know that it was very bad. Myself, I tried it, it was very, very bad. And uh, using that, they use the LSTM neural network, which means long, short term memory, which is a kind of deep architecture of neural network. So, with eight encoder and 
eight decoders layers. And using that, so look at the result. So it reduces translation errors by an average of 60% compared to the whole system, which was based on phrase, uh, which was based on phrase translation. So this was really one of the big milestones. And me really, at that time, I was doing my PhD. And I noticed when I start to type some translation, I was I was kind of screaming, wow, what's happened? Like completely different uh, level of accuracy. So this was the first time they introduced the, the neural network. And they, I would say, have a new level of translations. Sometimes I found that are better than for me as a who say learner of English and French, better than what I would think. Okay, so this is uh, what I wanted to show concerning Google. And then uh, more recently in 2070, we have introduction of you know that what yeah exactly the transformers so the transformers comes in and this is this architecture that very take the nlp to new heights so now what you are seeing a very break, big breakthrough are based on transformers so transformer is a simply is a new architecture so mm -hmm. a new way of calculating with the different uh, of calculated value through the data on the data to get a result. You can think about it as a function because neural network, in fact, is by the, by the end of the day is a function. You put some X inside it and you get some Y at the end. So the transformer is a kind of F function that gives very good results. And uh, now af after being a breakthrough in NLP, now people are even using in computer vision as well to get even better results. From 2070, we, we start to see the transformer, which is a new architecture or a new function for a neural network that uh, I would say give us a better result, much better than what we have before. And it solves some of the challenges we are having using uh, the traditional recurrent neural network because most of the time all nlp based model were based on the recurrent neural network uh, the lstm that i've just saw from google is a re recurrent neural network in fact and the problem is with this architecture is that as the name uh, said is recurrent so it process word one after the other so this process was very slow and the transformer came to process the whole data in parallel so and doing that they were able to solve the problem and even be able to solve the problem of uh, what we call long range memory because if you give it three phrases the neuro tend to forget what's happened in the first sentence for example so with the transformer you are able to give much more longer sequence and it's able to have I would say all these sentences or all, all these words in memory and be able to make a very good work at understanding what is inside the sentence or in the corpus. So as I mentioned here, the introduction of transformer allows to reach new heights of performance and take more and take on more challenging tasks. So more difficult tasks now you are able to use to, to do them with the transformers. And uh, recently in 20 21 and on, we have the introduction of what we call the, the LLMs. So, in fact, they exist before, but they were not large. We just, we just have language model before. But now we have this large language model. And one example of them is the GPT. You, you, you have heard about chat GPT, but there are two components. There is a chat and the GPT. The GPT means generative pre-trained transformers. So this is the transformer behind the scene. Okay. So this model is what we call LLMs. 
In fact, the ChatGPT is not the LLMs, in fact. It's a derived, I would say, a fine-tuned model, like we, uh, I would say, a derivative, a derivative model. So based on the GPT, they create another model. That is what we know, the ChatGPT, which has the DPT and what I call air RLHF, which is which means reinforcement learning from human feedback. So this is a way, in fact, to train the model. So they use the base model, the chat GP, the GPT, and they based on the, the knowledge that this network has, they training on a specific task of question answering. And they do it with human. So you type a question, the algorithm try to give an answer. And then a person, a human, will kind of annotate the, 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 the response to say it's a, it's a good response or not. And they make some kind of follow-up questions. Follow up questions. So this model has been trained to answer follow-up questions. That's why when you go to ChatGPT, you ask one question and then you back and you ask another question, it answer, it answer, it answer. So this is how it has been built behind behind the scene. The reinforcement learning allows him to make this follow-up question answering. Follow up. So this is the component of the reinforcement learning. But after you will see in the, in the example, we will use a language model, which is the base, to see so that you, understand, you may understand what is a, this basic model. It's a very simple model, in fact. But the, the, its strength lies in its scale. It's a very big model that has billions of parameters. It has been trained as well on billions of data. You can think about all the data of, of internet. What? Why does it hallucinate? How does it? Why does it hallucinate? Sometimes you ask it a question and then it gives you an answer that doesn't have a question. Yeah. Right? You know, <laughs> as human, human beings, our work, there's always some room for improvement. Uh, improvement. So people are working on the isolation right now, how to kind of stop them. And even, for example, there's another problem of giving sensitive information. Because when you type, you, you give him a problem or a situation. I remember I've seen an article, some, there has been some leaking data from one big company in the world. Well, you know, the, comp the, the, the employees started to use ChatGPT and they put everything about the code, you know, the internal code of the company inside, and they asked ChatGPT to solve the problem, the bug that they have. And finally, ChatGPT get this information. And people from wireless were able to get this information back again from the chat GPT. So these are some problems people are trying to solve. So this is an ongoing you know, work. We have some breakthrough, but there are some limitations. And you have to work hard to overcome this limitation. And this is science, you know, science is always that. Like, you know, a same thought. You get close, but you don't touch it, in fact. So this is how it's work. So we are trying to make better, but there are always room for improvement. improvement. Okay, so uh, after talking about the the transformer, oh, sorry. So there is no question. I can go. No more question. Okay. So here I want to highlight some of the main points for me that are key for the success of NLP. I would say modern NLP. And they are very important to many important concepts, basics, but they are very important to understand. The first thing for me is word embedding or vec of word vectors. These are very important components, or I would say a way of thinking about words. Because before people used to have a one hot encoding representation of words. For example, you give a uh, to the algorithm, a corpus, given a, a simple sentences, we are in Indaba X Gambia. So each word, uh, I would say in the sentences, in the sentence, repeat one time. 
So I can create a vector that has the size of the number of words in the sentence. And for example, for we, I will give, I will say it, it corresponds to a first index. So I will, I will represent we by one and the other one as zero. Ah, the all is zero, but the second index is one, and so on. This is what we call one hot encoding. So people were using this kind of, imagine if you have a very big corpus, a corpus of 20 words. You're going to have a vector of 20 words as well. But it can buy some repetition, so that can reduce the size. But this is what, what our people were using to represent words and doing the different computation. But after what, what, with the introduction of deep learning, they come up with this idea of word embeddings. And these are, from there, all the breakthroughs started. So we are, are going to come back with this concept of word embeddings. Then, for me, we have a better deep learning architecture. For example, Transform is a very good uh, architecture, which is a very good and uh, important ingredient of this, for the success of NLP. And then, transfer learning. Transfer learning is one of the most powerful, I would say, concept in this whole deep learning. Because it can save a lot of resource, time, money, and so on. So I'm going to go back uh, a little slowly on this element. So concerning the word embeddings. So these are, in fact, vectors that represent the word. But this representation, in fact, has a semantic meaning. So here I show a picture of the neural network. You see the input layer. Most of the time, you put the data there. And the data is processed layer by layer until the output. We are OK with that. We all know this process. Everyone is OK. And when we train our model, so the model has some weight or some parameters that are in the connection, that lies within, within the connections. And through the back propagation, so the algorithm that update the weight, we update all the weight, but the, but the data is never update. The data is never update because the data is what we, we have. We can't, you know, it's something imitable. You can't modify the data. But the idea of what embeddings, in fact, we modify the data. This is one big difference. So I mentioned the, the example. Can I write? Here? So uh, let me write the R in, in the uh, X in the Gambia. So this is my corpus. OK. And I mentioned earlier, the way we represent it in the computer, we use what we call one hot encoding. So if my whole corpus is that, I will decide myself. So we is the first word that I see. If I've never seen this word, I say, OK, it is one, zero, zero. The number of zero is the number of words that I have in the sentence. One, two, three, four, five. So one, two, three, four. So one word, five, six. So here I have six. This is we. What will be uh, the representation of R? Can you follow me? What I'm going to have here? What? Zero. Are you sure? Uh, no, zero, in fact, and then one here, and then zero until the end. So in fact, the idea is I consider one vector that has the size of all the words here. And each word will be represented by a one at the index that I will decide. So here, A, for example, is the second word, so I don't mind, I, just, I will just use the second index. But for example, if I, I find another R here, 
afterwards, and we use the same representation. I, I won't use another one. You see. So for in, it will be zero, zero. Okay, so you get it. One zero. So this is how we use to represent words. We call it one word encoding, and make the computation with that. So I, I'm talking about topic modeling. We use matrix factorization for things that they use to make a matrix and build a computation. But what happened with word embeddings? They say that, okay, look, let's say we will give it another vector that has a size that we decide. We decide ourselves a size. So let's say 10. So a vector of size cell, 10. But what is inside this vector? We give this vector random values random values and we do it for every word in the sentence then we come here to the neural network depending on the task that we want to do so the output if you want to make a sentiment analysis or something like that we are going to train the model but when you train the model and we do the back propagation to to update the weight but we go and on the data, this random vector, we update them. You update them at each step. And doing, in doing so, after we notice that the, the neural network is converging, like giving us great results, researcher says that, so how oh, this, vec this vector can look like? So, and they, they try to analyze this vector. They found that this vector, in fact, has some select meaning. So this is the main ingredient, one of the main ingredients of NLP. All the transformer that we have, you will, you will heard about token sometime. Token, token. So the token is a piece of the, not exactly a word, but a piece of a sentence. And each token has an embedding, in fact, to represent it. And if, if you, you, are, you, have, you take some time to play with chat DPT API, we talk about this embedding. And there are some costs associated with it embedding. These are these vectors, in fact. So for you to understand is like the same word, for example, has been trained on a very large corpus. So the word has appeared in different contexts with different meaning. Can you think about that? And the computer trying to make sense of what is happening on these different contexts. And in doing so, because you are training the, the, the model and updating the vectors. So in updating the vectors, if you try to update the vectors in a way that converge to some task that you want. And for example, if these tasks require you to understand what is in the sentence, the computer, uh, the model, will start to understand a little bit what is going inside. So whatever, what are the, the link between this word and this word? And doing that on very large corpus of data, you are able to see what we see right now. So with ChatGPT, in fact, it doesn't see the word that you type. By the way, you see the embedding in fact. You type the word, transform the, by, 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 to, to the embeddings. And the embeddings, there are some process behind the with matrix multiplication with embeddings. And get the result as embeddings. And then there is another layer to convert the embedded back to the world. You understand? So, to give a better example of word embeddings, for example, look here. People have tried this and it works. King, the embedded vector is a vector of value. And as I said, we decide on the size of the vectors. So, if they, have, they all have the same size, you can do multiplication, addition, and so on. So they use the embeddings after training on large corpus. They use the embeddings that represent the word king. They do minus the vectors and the embedding vectors of women plus man. They found a vector that is close to queen. You see, this is what this is what researchers are discovering. They found that oh. This is wonderful. These vectors are able to understand what's going behind the scene. So the vector has, in fact, a meaning, with, uh, I would say, semantic meaning of the word, in fact. 
So a vector is what? A bunch of values. But these bunch of values are well calibrated to understand what we, we, we want or how we use this word. Because it learns from the corpus that we give to the, to, to the algorithm. What? I said that is its added advantage. Exactly. So this, because the one I coded is a dumb, you know, some, if, if, if you are already use Panda, when you want to do one encoding, you saw, you know the name they use for that? PT dot dumb. They use the no, name, yeah. they, they, they name it dumb. That means it's dumb. You know, this representation is kind of dumb, in fact. <laughs> but, you know, with this embedding, we have a better representation and the word has a meaning. And using this word, we can do much, a lot of application because the, 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 the computer understands a little bit of our uh, words. So you can understand what we are saying. Another example here, so that we can, you can uh, see better. Uh, I mentioned later uh, before, we can give a size of 10, but most of the time you will see in your literature, they use 255. So most of the time, or 124. So this is the, the, the size of this embedding, so they are very large. So our people were able to understand this. Most of the time they use uh, PCA, to reduce the, the dimension of the vectors, to project it back in two dimension. And this is one example here. You see the vector frames. So these are what, because what uh, the, what the corpus comp have uh, some sentence with friends, with German, with anything. So they try it on some on this word. So they use the Berlin vector. So after applying PCA to go from two 56 size of a vector to to that to to, to a vector of dimension two, they project it in the plan as you can see here. So when you take Berlin vectors and you make minus Germany, if and you make plus France, you, you see the vector you get and you see the vector of Paris. You see they are close because the idea is uh, Berlin is a, is a city. And I remove the town or the, the, the country where the city is, which is German. And I add the other country, which is France, it gives Paris. That means it understands that Berlin is the capital of Germany. That's why it gives us a capital of France. So that means, the, 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 in fact, the, the neural network here, he understood what's going on. You know, what is the semantic meaning of the city. You know that Berlin is not like another city in Germany. And Paris, the same. So this is one of the most powerful uh, concept in NLP. And all the things that you, 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 you see are built up on this uh, concept of embeddings. <clears throat> so very simple idea. We give random values to a vectors, but through the corpus, we update these random values and they converge to a kind of meaning, a vector that is meaningful and represent the world. Any question? Oui? Google Bard. Google Bard. Google Bard. So Google Bard is like GPT, like GPT. It's the same thing. They use a pretrained model. I don't know which pretrained model they use. And the training with the reinforcement learning for doing the question answer, answering task to get bad. So it's the same process. The technology is here. In fact, if you have a local language here, uh, Madenka or Wolof, you can do the same for Wolof. Yeah. Lambda, lambda, okay. So the base model is lambda, the pretend model. Okay, uh, the last ingredient is transfer learning. So uh, transfer learning, so I can explain it simply by you know, this sentence. is the idea that you have a model and you train your model on the data that I named D1 for a task T1. And you want to use the same model for solving another task 
two, given another data, D two, but the data uh, and the task D two and T two are kind of close to the previous one. I mean D one and T one. This is the idea of transfer learning. So I train my, mod my model for doing one task, and want to, I want to use it for another task based on other, another data. But this data some have, should have some kind of similarities. This is the idea of transfer learning. And I think uh, Jeremy was talking about it uh, before. And in fact, this, this concept has been discovered in computer vision, in fact. So was computer vision, people doing computer vision discovered it. And then people apply it in NLP, and they got very good, good results. Do you know how we transfer the learning of a model from one task to another task? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or when you get to a certain day, or let's say that you have another one of the best one is the mobile phone. Mobile phone, yeah. So because already the model learn uh, up to a certain day, so you can just add, you can just use that transfer line to create the mobile phone instead of recreating the mobile phone. Good. So the idea is just like if you learn something, yeah. before uh, if you want to add, uh, if you want to learn another thing, that won't need for you to be receiving your entire program. Yeah. So that's a great answer. Did you get what he, he said? Yes. So you mentioned that if you are you train a model to recognize a laptop, so you build a model is able to find to recognize a, a laptop. And after what you want to recognize, for example, a mobile phone, you're not going to start again from scratch. You can use what you have learned from your model. You can use the previous model to learn how to recognize a uh, mobile phone. Yeah. Because ultimately, a dot is a dot, a line is a line, you know, shapes are shapes. So, yeah. yeah, so that's, this is one of the mo most important thing here. In fact, what's happened is that if researchers look at the network, they found that the first layers of the network are able to detect what we call general features, yeah. like line, dot, corners, as you know, you can use any shape. You can divide any shape into smaller, simple shape. For example, a basic example, you can decompose any shape into small segments. We are, we are okay with that, small segments. So if the model use many segments to assemble it, to find, for example, a human shape, so we prefer keeping this uh, ability to find segments, even if tomorrow we are going to detect, instead of human shape, we are going to detect a screen shape. Because by the end of the day, they are all segments. So this is the idea of transfer learning. And we do the same with NLP. But the transfer learning is NLP happen in two, two parts. The basics, in fact, they are transfer learning because they learn from the corpus how, what a word means. What is the meaning of a word? They learn it from a corpus. So you can then apply to another corpus, but if it, as it is the same language, there are some chances that the meaning is the same. So in fact, using the embedding from one uh, pretend model to another one is a transfer learning as well. But at the same time, we, we can have also this, the, the transfer learning at the network level. So we network, for example, the transformer, you can keep some weight for transfer it. So in NLP, we have two parts of, I will say two transfer learning, and it happened in two parts. For computer vision, it was only the network, but for uh, NLP, the word representation is a transfer learning. We use it for doing transfer learning, and we use it as well the neural network. <laughs> yeah, so this is what I want to mention about transfer learning. And uh, also, for example, it allows us to what we call fine tune 
the previous model to get a better one. An example is ChatGPT. From GPT to ChatGPT, it is a fine-tuned process. So we use the GPT model first, and we fine-tune it to create the ChatGPT, which is a very powerful model. And people are fine-tuning to do some other models to resolve, to solve other problems. What? So it's the same thing. In fact, the, so the expression, so we express doing transfer learning is fine tuning, in fact, because we kind of, uh, how, we see, how could I say, fine tune, refine, yeah, refine the weight of the model. So we are not starting from scratch, but we are using what was before in the model and we refine it. That's what we call, we call it fountain. So, apply to any model. So it depends because if your model has been trained on a given data, you can use this model that, that has been trained. Because when we talk about transfer learning, you should have a pre-trained. So that means your model should have been trained before. So, and we transfer the learning that has been acquired from the previous learning. That's what we call transfer learning. Because he learned before, he wants to transfer his learning to another task. You see, so you should have always a trained model before. So uh, I'm wondering, is it like when you're building a data for this in the future, you for the uh, scenario where someone wants to actually use this model on the yeah, for example, so now we are what we call now foundation model. We will hear about it. Foundation model. So these are model like GPT is a foundation model. People are now focusing on building foundation model because we found that when you train a foundation model, you can use it and fine tune it on infinite problems, basic infinite problems. So this is so this is a, a, I would say a uh stream of research so uh, is a way of, of how do we call it an area of research yeah exactly for working about thinking about uh, how to build better foundation model so that people can use it to find tune for other tasks okay so uh let's now walk through uh, an example uh, on Google Colab. Okay, so disclaimer. So this notebook that I'm using is from a book. Voilà. If, I don't know if you know Fast AI. It's a, it's a library <coughs> yeah, for deep learning that has been on top of PyTorch. Mm -hmm. So PyTorch is uh, like Keras, TensorFlow, mm -hmm. Fast AI, PyTorch. Yeah. So uh, let me go open my Uh, here we are going to go through different steps in order to make, I would say, a sentiment analysis. But before doing that, we will build a language model or we will use a language model, which is what we have in LLMs, like GPT. So we will see so give you a bit a bit of an idea how this large language model are built. And we see that they are built very, very simple concepts. They're not very difficult. The main problem is the scale. Big model, big data, and the, all the engineering headache that go with that. That's all. But the concept is very, very simple. <clears throat> so uh, for the text, I will let you afterward <laughs> uh, read it in detail. In detail. So perhaps uh, I think we can look at these sentences that are very interesting. Uh, so the language model, which is the main foundation here, because when we want to do uh, sentiment analysis or any task on NLP, the first thing is the language. So we want to be sure that the model can understand the language. 
this was the main motivation for people to create what they, they call a language model. Because before the before the, the these neural networks, so people were just jumping and trying to solve a problem, find some pattern in the, in the sentence, doing for example, for example, the one encoding things like that. But when doing this uh, neural networks, people start thinking about what about trying to get the computer understand our uh, language first, and then if you understand it. We can ask him to do anything because we we speak through our language, and if he, he understands our language, so we can give many orders, and we'll be able to respond to what we, we want. So this is the idea behind the language model. And uh, I will say to summarize, the question come: How can I train a language model? So it's a very big question. In fact, people have been thinking about it. For, for years, but someone came up with a simple idea, which is, okay, I have a big corpus of test. What if I take one sentence, I take one part of the sentence, but I don't, for example here, we are in Java X, the Gambia. What about giving to the computer we are in that's it this is not very easy even for human to give a very good word it's not not easy in fact but we try to learn to, to train a computer to do this task it's a simple task so the first time we try it, I try it on the whole Wikipedia English test with data this. Can you imagine the whole Wikipedia data? So give a chunk of words. <coughs> imagine what, what is the, the next word. For like we have case in here, it should be on Java X. But the, the, the computer can answer the house or the, for example. They are kind of correct, but in our case, it won't be correct because we want in the other So we force the model to try to find in the other case in this context. We are going to give him another sentence again. And the same thing. The same thing. So we can imagine on millions of sentences. And by the end, we're trying to use this model, giving him some piece of words, and ask the model to give some following words. The from that day, well, the model was able to give reasonable sentence, even if it is not correct, but the grammar structure is correct. Though we didn't uh, teach the grammar, the rule of the grammar, this is a verb, this is a noun, this is a, and so on. But the model was able to give a very meaningful uh, completion of the text. And people say that, okay, if the model is able to do that, perhaps it's understand a little bit of our language. And then try, yeah. Yeah, sometimes you see that if you write a um, sentence, you write it, you want to write it, that you can see that the computer is going to suggest the words to the sequence. Like, is it that it has already learned from it? Mm -hmm. Can you come again? And then, like, oh, yes. if I write, we are in, in the box. Yeah. Like, yeah, in, in, in Gambia. Yeah. Then I erase what? Then I want to rewrite it. You're going to see that the computer is going to give you, like, propose the words sequentially. So you can write it sequentially. Yeah, exactly. So is it like the, it has already learned from it? That's why it's giving you that. <laughs> in, in fact, when you apply it, it won't give uh, necessarily the, the word that you want. But what we found is that it, some, it gave us some meaningful ending of the word. For example, here it might be that after training, for sure, because when you, you are not training the model, it means, for example, here we are in, uh, you see, fire. It might be fire at the beginning. But afterwards, when you, you train for billions of texts, because he has many, he has seen many contexts. In fact, we are just make a, a summary. In fact, what we do, we start first by we. 
we give it we and give an ending. Then we give the, the sentence we are, give the next word. Then we give we are in. We do it for all the, the whole corpus of Wikipedia. We say, oh, it has been true. Yep. So, uh, in this case, I don't, I don't necessarily think that it is the uh, AI level. I think it's just in the computer that's possible to be of course, you know, that before, and then we show this to you. In this time, we can't break it again. In the first aspect, we have to ask for it. Yeah. Yeah. That would be the point. Yeah. When you type it once, I'll give you one more show. I'll give it to you again. I think that we have to ask for that. I think we have to give it to you. I think I think uh, Google yeah, does this. No, Google. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Google does. They try to personalize, you know, some of the things that you write. So he's correct in a way. For example, if you went online to Google and you search for uh, what is the nicest airport uh, that just came to my head, I don't know how. But yes, nicest airport. Then when you try to search again, uh, starting with that, it tends to complete that because it's sort of personalized. It's it's trying to understand. So the things that you search for and helping you to, to sort of auto-complete it. Yeah, it happens. It's personalizing. Yeah, they do that. Personalization is what they call it. Uh, I'm not sure yet. Yeah. Uh, I've got a question. So, okay. so let's say you go to Google. Yeah. And this time you search for maybe like Ishmael, it will bring Kone for you. Yeah, yeah. It will yeah. try to assist you by writing Kone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you know, in the drop down list. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. It's, it's more personalized. Personalized, exactly. Yeah. You use what you. you. So yeah. we frequent words. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so uh, hopefully the, the idea is clear how this uh, model. Of this foundation model, the GPT is trained. So basically, this is what the way it's trained. Uh, given a sentence, try to uh, guess what's the next word. But the idea is, is we want the computer to give some next words that are meaningful, not just rubbish, no, just random words. And in doing so, this computer or this uh, algorithm gets some ability to understand our language. And given this model, we fine tune it for another task. And in fact, the, the guy that came up with this idea, it was in 2018. He tried to apply it for sentiment analysis and he set the new set of the art uh, performance for that because they used some other methods before. But using this approach, he was able to beat the state of the art and set new state of the art performance for uh, sentiment analysis. And it was then this year, 2018, that people start to rethink every task as first language model, then fine tune for your task. Not just trying to uh, 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 attain your task directly. So, so here, uh, so this is for example here, the, the main process. So the, mo the model has been trained on wiki test. So to build a language model, which, which has one ability, just one thing, give him a bunch of words if we give the next word, nothing more than that. Then what he does, uh, he trained the model in fact on a data set of movie reviews. We call it the data test IMDB. And the idea that the, the, this guy said, he said Wikipedia is a very general task. But for example, the model is not used to the kind of test that we see in reviews. So he said that instead of trying to do a sentiment analysis directly, try to make a fine tuning for reviews kind of text first. So try to predict next word in the context of movie reviews instead of the context of Wikipedia document. You see the difference. So you make a first fine tune to make the model more uh, used to the context of movie reviews. And then using this fine tune model, it train a classifier to identify the polarity of the review. Is it positive, like uh, the 
consumer are happy with, with the movie or is it negative or is it neutral so this is the the main the main idea the main uh, steps for for that so for the pro text processing so i think you can read it later but there are some very important details in fact to understand what's going on because i've talked about the, the notion of token yeah tokenization so sometimes there are words so we we split the whole corpus of in words but sometimes they are not words they are what we call sub words because for example in english we have this uh, suffix i would say less speech less uh what less here? You have many, many words. Top less. Top less. Uh, so, for example, so if we can split this word between top and less, or uh, pay less, pay and less, so you can get more structure. You can expose more structure of the corpus to the algorithm. So that's why sometimes people use what we call subword tokens. So it depends. So the token there are a whole bunch of research on the token. And in fact, this is the part where linguistic impact can come in and input the knowledge domain. Because each language has its own structure of words. So given the, 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 the language knowledge, you know how to better, for example, speech. Because this example that I just gave for speechless, for example, for someone that knows English, you know that the less is as a meaning and speech as a meaning. And when you put them together, it means that but if it's another language, perhaps this, this won't be uh, necessarily the same thing. So, so for each language, we have some way of understanding the structure behind the, each word. Mm -hmm. So that's why, for example, doing the tokenization, in fact, is an area of research. People are sitting researching right now. So if, for example, we try to do it for our local language, for example, I'm sure that none of what we have in the West will, will work good. We should have some people that know better the language to know how to better split into pieces that are meaningful for the understanding of our corpus. So this is something very important. So we have a tokenization. When we do this the tokenization, we get what we call a kind of vocabulary. The vocabulary is basically what I showed you, like a one word echo. But the difference is that for each one, we will give a vector, what we call an embedding vector. We give for each one an embedding vector. And this is the vector that we use, in fact, to compute and to find the next word. When, when, when I say that, we try to find the next word. The words are not compute directly. We use the embedding vectors to compute, to find the next vector, the next uh, word vector. You get the, the meaning. Okay, so after doing the tokenization, uh, so you will get the time to to read it because I will share the link. Uh, so this is, for example, an example of tokenization here. So they have taken uh, the sentences, the sentence. This movie, which I just discovered at the video store, apparently sits. And applying the tokenizer, we get this movies, uh, even the coma, which I till the end. You see, there are some others cases, for example, that are more compl complex. Here we have the dollars, so. The tokenizer was able to identify the dollars here. He knows that this is not part of the world, is you know, kind of unit for currency. So this is this is why I say the domain log is important because people had code, in fact, this. They have some code inside the library to identify uh, some mark for currency and things like that. And uh, then when we finish. The, the tokenization, we do what, uh, because for the computer, you must know that the computer doesn't know I, you, to the different words are 
sense, uh, nonsense for the computer. The computer just needs values. So it's a matter of rep representation of this word. And the, the word embedding is a way to, to represent the words in a meaningful way. So in a sentence, for example, we want to, the computer to be able to, ident to identify the beginning of a sentence, for example, or a mark. That's why they create this, I would say, this dumb word they create, but they have some meaning here. The B B O S means beginning of stream, in fact. So when you start a sentence, for example, here, the US dollars one is one dot zero zero. So to give it to a computer, you want the computer to know that this is the beginning of the sentence. So we create a small word for that, that we, we call it XXBOS. And we create another word again for capital letter, majuscule, for, for the T. Because uh, we have a problem of vocabulary. For example, if we have the with uh, uh, capital letters and the without capital letters, there will be two different vectors for them. But you should want find a way, because for us human, we understand that they are all the same. But the difference is that we are starting a sentence. So in order to encode this in the computer, they come up with this idea to put first, they, they put all the text in lowercase. And for the beginning of sentence, they use this word XXMAG, so that the computer will know that this is the, this letter is uh, in capital letter. So this is some way of encoding things like, I would say, punctuations uh, and uh, other things that, are, that we found in our text. So given that uh, we are able to, so they have, these are some kind of uh, words, even they have some unknown that indicates that the word is unknown because you train your, your model on some vocabulary. But what's happened if you, get, you, you give him a, a new word, what will happen? So there's a way to encode unknown words, for example. So this, uh, you know, the details that the, all these big models deal with behind the scene, in fact. And uh, yeah, so let's go, uh, let's move on the sub words. Uh, you can read on this afterward. Okay, so here, I think something interesting. Uh, I would say basically here is the mapping. So as I mentioned, so each word will have a representation, a vector that represents this, this word. But also we create a dictionary of index, like this one. Like the index one means this word, and this word, this is the vector that represents this word. So we create this kind of uh, mapping for each vector. For each word, we have an index. And this index, in fact, it will point to a big matrix where each line in this big matrix is an ve embedding vector. So this is, uh, so let's say, uh, word one, word two, until word n. And you have here uh, an embedding, and we call it E1. Until e so we have some index. So W1 can be, in our case here, the word B. So we have a kind of mapping to find a way to go from the word to the embeddings and the embedding back to the word. As I mentioned from chat DPT, I, I said that the chat DPT didn't see the word U that you type. It will see through this mapping the embeddings, you will do the computation on the embeddings. When we find the final embeddings, you will go again to this matrix to find back the word and show it to you. We say what's always happened behind the scenes. So we should have this mapping. It's very important to have it so that we can move from, I would say, the computation, the computer representation of the word and the human representation of the word. Okay, so when we build this uh, matrix, then 
we say so you can look at it afterwards so so these are some obviously some methods that are inside fast ai that allow you to process the data very easily and have a visualization uh, a, a very interesting visualization of the data and uh, yeah i think this is the part what is becoming interesting so you say lm data loader so this is the language model data loader so it is a class inside the library that allows you to uh, load some corpus for building a language model so hopefully you you will go through the notebook because uh, i would say all the detail has been written so it has been well written and i think you won't be able to have a big problem so i will move uh, so here we we get the data so these are some methods here to get the data on the disk so they have a folder train test and on sup and uh, this is the, the api data block inside the library that allow you to easily grab the data without doing much coding yourself so they, they abstract all the detail in this uh, um, class. And then when you get the data, you can show some batch of data. You know, when we do training, we have some batch of data. So this is the text, and this is the, the other part of the test. And if you notice, look here, it starts with, with XXBOS, and the other side it starts with the second word here till the end of this one plus a new word it's like there are two both same text but one has one words one more words than the other one so it's like they are like they are one uh how could i say so perhaps i can blow it so, so this is one problem this is the other one and the idea is that when you do the training, you get this one and you ask to predict the first one here. When you move to the second one, you take the first and the second and you ask to predict the second here. This is the way they put the data to allow us to make this prediction of the next one. So this is uh, how it it's works. And given this data here, we train the model here with a simple the simple instruction here so the model here is a, a lstm model in fact and you they train it uh, using this approach so on one epoch first they save the model and they train it again for 10 epochs so uh, let's see here as i mentioned before so the model has been trained on wikipedia then here it has been trained again on the uh, IMDB database. And IMDB database is, a new, is another structure of tests, not the same like Wikipedia, which is more formal definition of things, uh, what's happening in the world. But here is more casual language, what, like, like people express themselves about a movie. So after doing that, we try this model to generate following words. So for example, here we use, I like this movie because. What can be the following word that the model can predict? And the idea here, as we train the model to predict just one word, what we do, we ask him to predict the next word. But based on the next word that he gave us, we put all together and we ask again to predict the next word so that we can predict a whole sentence. And doing that, this is one example we get. I like this movie because of its story and characters. Meaningful. At least it's meaningful, even if it's not what I want. But this sentence is meaningful. And it continues again. The storyline was very strong, very good by, for a sign. Uh, five film the character and it's gone 
So it's like now the model is understand what's going on when, in the movie review. You know, when someone likes a movie, what are the main reasons that makes someone like a, 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 like a movie? And it's giving some kind of reasons. So we try it two times. So because it is kind of generation, it's kind of random. So it will change each time you ask him. So we ask him again, I like this movie because I like the idea of premise of the movie, the very convenient virus and so on. So you see the model, in fact, is giving some text that has kind of meaningful, in fact. And based on this model, we learn, we, we, we ask the model now to detect if the review is positive or negative, the polarity of the, of the review. And with that, uh, so now the data set looks like that. You have a review here, and then you have a category which is negative, for example. And here it is negative again, negative. So, and uh, going forward, we train the classifier now to detect if the movie is negative or positive. And we get an accuracy easily, one epoch of trainings only. Only one epoch of training, we get 92% of accuracy. Just one epoch. Because the model understands the language. So it's very easy to fine tune it to another task. So, so these are more interesting techniques to train better the model. So they were able to reach uh, 94% of accuracy. We call it a uh, gradual phrase, phrasing of the weight. So you can look, uh, read it uh, after to, to get more, more details. OK, so this is uh, what I wanted to share with you. So the main process of having a language model pretend to do very dumb task, just predicting as the next word. But this language is very powerful because what we have at GPT is based on this kind of training. I would say one difference is with GPT is that they have been trained also on mask words. Instead of predicting the next word, we put some, I would say, missing word in the sentence. Let's come back to this sentence. We are in the Gambia. We are in, in Dada, it's the Gambia. You can mask here. We, we put here a mask. Okay, so this is how we pronounce it. We, we write, we can write mask here and in, in Dava X. And we ask the model to predict which word should be here. So this is one difference between the GPT and the So these both combine, predicting the next word and fill up within word. And that's it, you have your GPT. The other problem is uh, just a matter of scale and the engineering of how to get all this internet data into your, 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 your machine and your vault and uh, dealing with all the engineering process. But the idea is very simple. Predict next word or fill up some words inside the sentence. And then you have a model that understands your language. And based on that, you can fine tune to any task. Fine tune for question answering, you get chat GPT. Fine tuning, I don't know, for assess the level of knowledge of a student and give recommend recommendation about what what are the gap in his knowledge so that he can uh, learn further. So people are, are, are working on this task now. Like you have an assistant for your learning. So some questions, some tests, based on the result of the test, the algorithm will say that these, these are the gap of your, in your knowledge. So you have to go to learn this, 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 make sure you understand this so that you can perform better later. So there are some people working on this task right now. So now, let's say if you want, if you want to modify the model, let's say on our own On our own? Lang local language. Because now I see, the, the, I think we now we have a fuller character. I also see the uh, one data, I think, that's which was the code. Exactly. So the same process can be applied. Absolutely, the same process. But one of the problem, we are a local language. We call we call our language low resource language because you don't have, you know, this abundance of data. 
like what we have in English or in French or in German. This is one. Uh, in fact, I want to come back to the slide. To, but for the practical, so I was not able to go in details. But normally, I'm sure if you you read the text, it will make sense for you. For sure. Okay. So you have another question about that. I want to come back to the slide because what you asked. You related to my last to my last slide. Questions? Okay, you can move on. Uh, do you think sixteen thirty should be fine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just one slide. Okay. So, NLP opportunities for Africa. So, we. Uh, discuss these movie reviews. They all work on English, on French, on German. But what about us as African? What challenges do we face? And what can we do with NLP to solve this uh, challenge? I want to ask uh, one thing. This is one problem that I've looking for a long time. Sometimes, me, I'm here. My mother is in Ivory Coast. Sometimes I want to call her in WhatsApp, but it's impossible. She can't use the phone to manipulate it to call on WhatsApp. Right. This is the reality. That, and I have discovered many people, and uh, we, found, we, we, we face it countless in our family. We found someone that has a, cell, a big cell phone. You say that, take my phone and call this person for me. Have you, have you yeah, witnessed yeah, this? Yeah. Okay, so I'm asking you a question. What can you do with this technology to help our people to better enjoy, in fact, all the outcome of this, uh, I would say, breakthrough technology? My question is, what? So I, I just motivate uh, what well, we want we want an uh, example so look at the struggle of our people using uh, a phone or whatsapp for example so what can you do for example patient and but the problem we had because we had some some data sets yeah. all, of, um, all was in English for so having somebody to let's say uh, either uh, having somebody to read those are those are texting to our local languages so that was the issue we had we are able to get yeah good example so you just mentioned the problem of doctor and patient consultation the patient don't understand clearly uh, very uh, English, for example, in speaking of the local language, uh, Madenka or Wolof, and the doctor don't, doesn't understand it. So what can we do in this situation? So it come up with the idea of translation. Yeah, great uh, idea. But what do you do exactly for doing this translation? You mentioned that you have some data set, uh, but they are in not on your language. Yeah, the data set can then be able to develop one application where you can do recording. Where you can do some recording? Yeah, recording. Let's say, to, to record let's say, let's say, I am sick. Yeah. For you, so we have a recorder. That is, someone would read that. You might be but having the person who is well uh, eloquent in the local language, let's say, to read an English text without not putting. Uh, Okay, but normally you should have a tool. It's, it's a matter of translation, in fact. Find the corresponding sentence from English to the other language. But you need people 
and we say linguists or people that understand really both yeah, languages to do that. So it could be room for volunteers to do what somewhere are asking for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I can relate because I'm working on a project like that right now. Yeah. Just yeah. 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 But the problem, for example, is that is the scaling, for example. So if there are um, a lot of people that are calling, are we able to have a large pool of uh, assistants to respond to each one of them? It just means in terms of the system um, organization, how people come up with the system. OK. Yes. Yeah. And you could get to Come again, I didn't get. I said once the system has started, started yeah. yes, so people would get used to it, like we would have the understanding that um, not everybody could be uh, attracted to privacy. Right? So once the system started, okay. it would be easier for people to come in and a company management system. Yeah, okay. Meaning, mostly it's for let's say this regulatory people have this is this GSM. So normally the process it takes more than half an hour. So mostly have a kind of assistant. Yeah, but that to data is for this. Okay. But let's come back. Let's that. Yeah. So what? What? My dear class, you know, we give this idea of having like a modern phone. A modern phone book. Yes. Yeah. But we have this core problem with the government parents, our elderly uh the elderly people they cannot uh they just go to find the contacts to yeah. for their phone because they don't understand it. Yeah. Yeah. So we are saying but well, they can see but they have a lot of things. Well it's why why is that this this actual task so we didn't necessarily go into the implementation, but we came up with the idea and the idea. So what we did was just the, the app was like the transcription video that transcribe when they are sitting, they are contact, and when they are starting from the So yeah. just the idea is just to be good of you know, course to translate any anything from any language. Okay, so the idea is for example, if someone wants to retrieve a uh, contact in the phone, they will be able to talk in language. Talk in the Indian language, yes. The language, yes. And the phone will translate and English or whatever it is in the story. When they are trying to see the Okay. Yeah, so you. Okay. Okay, now I just wanted to ask is it an app that interacts with the phone? Yes, it's an app. An app, right? So you open the app and you speak through the app and it communicates with the phone. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so in fact, this is a. In fact, all this, this product are already available. For example, people assistant that you have on the phone. Exactly. You can ask him to call someone for you. But like the problem is that he doesn't understand your language. Your language. Yes. So, in fact, so you see, these problems have already been solved, in fact. But but by people that care about the language, they have their own interest. So, and no one is going to think about their own problem. Otherwise, if they think about us, they are going to come back and send, send them to us. Yeah. 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 See, uh, see Prof. Kone, one funny, uh, one funny discussion I had with a friend, in, in, we met at Deep Learning in Dava in Tunisia last year. Tunisia, okay. Yeah, so he was telling me, do you understand why 
you know, uh, Google. I think Google has the wall of Bashar now. Yes. Yeah. But he was telling me, do you know why they want to get these languages so that they can understand when you speak, you know, so that at the end of the day, you can't hide anything from them. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I said, hmm, that's interesting, actually. Oh, yeah. 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 I don't know. Yeah. yeah, but, yeah. So, but otherwise, for me, even if, you know, we are able to to make this model, even uh, recently I've been in a conference in Rwanda, right? you know, ICLR. Yes, yes. So it was the first time to be in Africa. <clears throat> and they have a workshop, Africa NLP yes. workshop. Yes. In fact, they found that all these, you know, Google Translate, uh, yes. Meta, Meta, LLB, yes. no language left, left behind, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. all these models, they fall short for our own language. Yes. They show it, they do some simple example. And I was very astonished to find one Nigerian who told me that he saw on the internet some people fight, like a you know, kind of fighting, you know, shouting one over the other. Yeah. Why? Because the Nigerian, in fact, has, you know, he was sharing a success. And the other one goes to, went to Google search and make the translation of what can be a word to, to congratulate someone. But the transition was very wrong, and it means, in fact, it means something I opposite. Yeah, yeah. Like, I saw that. Yeah. And yeah. when he saw that, so they start to you know, fight over the internet. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Why? Because they were, they were using Google Translate for that. So, this Google Translate, they are kind of, I would say, doing some buzz about breakthrough for African language, but in fact, the work is very, yes. you know, there are some. Room for work to improve. A lot of work yeah, a lot of work to be done. I remember one of my professors who was in Germany saying, well, let's say, maybe it takes a language, let's say English, and he compared it to the same, the uh, same text, and then he compared it to German. And then, so before he will get to the last language, if you convert that to the language he started to do this story, you, you see it's not completely destroyed. Exactly, exactly, exactly. We have some notion of dying. For example, when you say nurse, automatically, is female. When you say doctor, automatically is male. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the people they, they, they try this, they, they try this to go translate. So there are some this, some some of these problems, and I want to emphasize as African, so we must work on this. And I think this is interesting that you are thinking about this kind of problem, how to make uh, people can use the cell phone through an app where they can communicate in their own language and have the uh, the phone respond to them. For example, I was thinking about my, my, my mother, for example, if she has this application and just thought, I want to call my son in Gambia. And, that, and then our, our team of this, delivery uh, easy. even for agriculture, this extra as farmers. Yes, yeah. yeah. the farmers to communicate with them about you know, the trade that they have and, yeah. and farm, something like that. So there are room for, for, for work. Yeah. And uh, I encourage everyone, even me, I, now I'm looking, I'm working on a project and we are, because in Africa, the problem, main problem is data collection. We don't, we don't have enough data. So this is the main problem. And now we have been working for almost one year just for collecting data. And we have all sorts of headaches you know, to, to collect the data. But at least we have some few data and we try to, to collect more more data. Yeah, so in, uh, in, in relation to that, in agriculture, I understand that in Ghana, among the livestock owners, there's a sort of an app with them. Yeah. Like when there is time for grazing, like in the yeah. rainy season, yeah. they will be at home and they have a special place for grazing. The government allocated a place specifically for grazing for the, the, the lives of people. So they will be at home with their device and app sort of in the mobile, then tracking the whereabouts of the animals, wherever the animal goes, which whatsoever that the animal might, mm. might, might head down there they will be with the device and plug in the animal. I don't know whether that is associated to AI or it, it concerns AI or artificial uh, So I don't know if they put some device in there to, to, lo to locate them, to track some yeah. kind they, so, they put some, so sometimes yeah. they put something on the yeah. neck yeah. and yeah. Yeah. to track them. So I would say this is not AI, but we can use it to do more interesting things. For example, like AI, you can start the pattern of the motion, so that in the season they tend to, you know, go this way or looking for these things. 
So there are many interesting things you can do differently because these are very good data about these animals and the pattern, how they live. You can do many, many interesting things. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. More questions? You are running out of time. Yes. So, yes. Minutes. Okay, so if there are no more questions, so thank you for your attention. Thank you. Very interesting session. <laughs>